drives people in the exact opposite direction from what we need to thrive. For heaven's sake, business in America thrives because they have research and development. They thrive because they can take young leaders and make them into mature leaders. They can pay, they can pay good competitive salaries. They can offer health care benefits. You know, these are the kind of things that allow, has allowed American business to thrive over the last 60 years. Yet we're supposed to do it with nothing. But the, more, the most important thing we have in common, and this is most germane to our conversation today, is the legislative process excludes us. Laws and policies are developed based on an antidotal understanding of what we do. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little thing. There's a, a variety of foundations in Texas, the Communities Foundation, and a variety of others in the state who have been very, very instrumental on a group I belong to called the Philanthropic Collaborative. And the idea was to take just the $40 billion a year that foundations give every year and determine what's, what's been going on with that. You know, where's, what kind of return have we got? Now, you know what's crazy? Nobody's ever done this. In 40 years of modern philanthropy, nobody's really stopped and said, what are we getting? And interestingly enough, it took about two years to develop this, and an economist, Robert Shapiro, did the math. And again, very conservative, very conservative. But you know what? That $40 billion, and by the way, $40 billion only represents a small slice of the broader $300 billion we get every year. That alone generated $500 billion cash money for local government and households. $500 billion in direct money. And we're not talking about the ripple buying effect of new cars, of rent, of groceries. So what you're looking at, what we produce every day, nine to one return on investment. And beat that Wall Street. <laughs> you know what the point is? Yeah, they, come on, that's an applause song. We've got to follow them back. Again, it's not, and I, this, I need to make this really clear. Legislators in America right now, they're just like you and me, man. They wake up in the morning trying to do what's right. If they got elected because they want to make their communities a better place to live. And these men and women are, are suffering, quite frankly, through a decision process that is just racking them. I mean, imagine, Texas has been frankly quite lucky, but you go up to Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, California. You know, last year, 47 states posted collectively $162 billion in deficits. And you know what states got to do? Man, states have to balance their budget. Unlike federal government, the states must balance their budgets. And they usually have three choices. They can either raise taxes, which is never popular. They can dip into reserves, which most states have already done. Or they can cut services. And the reality is, what they're cutting is based on an antidotal understanding, saying in effect, well, man, the domestic violence shelter would be nice, but, man, that's a luxury this year. We just can't afford it. You know those returning prisoners? Man, well, we just don't have money for the returning prisoners. You know, so this is what's going on. Now, again, these legislators aren't bad. But then, again, realistically, if you say to somebody in, in modern American politics, you have a dry cleaner and you have a domestic violence shelter, which one's more important in this economy? Well, intuitively, they're just going to say, oh, it's a dry cleaner, it's a business. They don't recognize that so is the domestic violence shelter. And what we've never done is really articulated the economic impact of helping women not only get out of abusive relationships, but rediscover themselves in the new American economy. This is a very, very important decision that we're, we're talking about here. And even more so when politicians, again, understandably start to look at property tax on universities, houses of worship. You know, what they're doing is they're understandably getting hungry. And they're looking at us. We are the biggest pot of untaxed revenue in America. Now, I'm not saying that we should not play a very important part in our economic recovery. What I am saying is we're not involved yet. i got to tell you, I love our new president. But last week there was a job summit at the White House. And of all the people assembled, there was only one person representing real direct service nonprofits. Now, I don't know about you, I put 80 people at the DC Central Kitchen. And half of those men were new Now, everybody starts at the kitchen at $13 an hour with full medical benefits, matching retirement, and paying the Now, the reality is, I am a kick ass business. <laughs> Again, um, I'm sorry, what's your name again, Rebecca? Jerry? Here's a 
classic example, Jerry. If Jerry had invested $1,000 in Microsoft in 1986, the day it went public, Jerry's got a half a million dollars. We're all going down a river walk tonight on Jerry. <laughs> but the reality is that Jerry had invested that same $1,000 in the Grameen Bank. Again, there's elevated 100 million people out of poverty. The small loan. Where your program or my program, all Jerry was eligible for was a one-time tax deduction. Now, why not an annual tax deduction with increasing value based on the same rate of return principle as a dividend check if you could show return? The number of people who can go back to prison, the number of kids who went to college, the number of women who started their own businesses. This is business, and that's just a policy. But what we have to do is elect a generation of people who don't see us as random acts of kindness, even though we are beautiful individual lights, but as a collective force in America that can actually be part of the dynamic rebirth of the new American economy. We have to fundamentally go out and elect a generation of people who understand this. And you are one of 36 states that next year will have that opportunity. You all are going to elect a new governor next year and get along with 36 other states. And you have a dynamic opportunity because you have, well, there is an incumbent in your race, the governor. And again, thanks to the governor and the amazing organization for pulling this together. But you have in this the potential for a really robust dialogue. Senator Hutchinson has announced, as has um, Mayor White from Houston. So within those three candidates, you have the power to really focus, to help them move beyond this notion of hating arts, housing, all these different subsector issues, and start to see us as a dynamic part of the economy. You know, what we need to do is come together, and that's what I hope I can partner with you to do next year. Because what I did is I evolved from the nonprofit Congress to a movement now called the B3 Campaign. It stands for the voice, the value, and the votes of the nonprofit sector. What we have to say to every candidate, look at what you all, you all represent. You all represent close to 400,000 votes in this state. 400,000 votes. And what you need to do is make sure that those candidates earn your vote, who work for your vote. Again, you want a candidate, if you're under 30, you want a candidate who understands that you have spent a large part of your life volunteering, and you are looking for an opportunity to roar in the state, to be part of its future. But you're not really interested in all due respect to all of us. A younger generation wants something than traditional charity. And you need to elect somebody who's going to help you get there. For all of us who are tired of fighting each other for grants, you know what we need? Access to capital. Access to capital. That's what's killing us. You know, I'd love to grow my businesses, but i got to go out and beg for a grant. And then i got to report every 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what we need is a very big access to capital. But what it's going to take, what it's going to take, brothers and sisters, is two important things. First thing is, we got to stand together. We must adopt an all-boats-must-rise strategy. Again, man, I love us all, and you should be proud. You should be proud individually of the work you've done. You know, when you think about this organization, one star. You know, it's saying, in effect, each one of you all is one star. You have shown pride in your community, and flowers are blooming all over the state because of your work. But the real power is when you speak with one voice. That is your power. And that's going to take work, but that's where we can start in 2010. The idea of reconvening somewhere in the new year with a variety of existing partners in this state that I am looking for that will come together and say to the nonprofits, we must find common ground. You know, again, if Andy and I were in the city, we both had dry camps. You know, right here on Main Street. Every morning I might wake to work, what walk to work praying. Sweet Jesus, I hope Andy's dry cleaner burned down last night. You know, every morning I get to work and it's like, hey, still there. You know, but I'm cutting eyes across the avenue looking at Andy over there thinking, man, this world would be a better place if Andy wasn't here. But the reality is, if somebody comes in and wants to regulate small business, Andy and I are down at the Chamber of Commerce working together. And that's the model we must adopt. There are times when we will have a hard time finding ground, but there are moments, and this election is one of them, where the power, the opportunity that presents itself, not just in this state, but to lead on a national level. Again, to lead on a national to show your brothers and sisters all around the country what Texans do when presented with an opportunity to change their future. Texans have never sat back and let the future come to them. They march out and meet it every single time. And that's all I'm asking you to do.